Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We hope that you are uplifted and encouraged by this wonderful sermon. Now I want to invite you to turn to that book of the Bible, the Gospel of John, because we are in the midst of a verse-by-verse series through this wonderful, wonderful book of Scripture, and we have titled this section of John, John 5 through 12, The Great I Am. Because in this section of John, in so many ways, Jesus is showing and teaching and demonstrating that he is nothing less than the divine son of God. And there are seven I am statements that Jesus makes throughout the gospel of John. And today we will consider the second of these statements, hearing Jesus confess to us and to the world, I am the light of the world. That's the title of the message today, light of the world, as we consider John 8 verses 12 through 30. A few weeks ago, our staff was enjoying lunch together on a Tuesday afternoon, and as we typically do in our staff lunches, we like to just share in some icebreaker questions to get to know one another a little bit better. It's a great way to get to know one another as staff members of the church. And several weeks ago, we were engaging in a a game called Would You Rather? Some of you are familiar with this game. It presents two options, and you have to choose one. They may be two positive options, and you have to decide which one is better, Or maybe two negative options, and you have to decide which one isn't worse. An example of two positive options would be, would you rather have the supernatural ability to fly or to be invisible? And so around the table, the various staff members shared their response to that question and not only gave their answer, but gave the reasoning for that answer. It's a great way to get to know one another better. Although when it comes to that question, if you have a friend who would rather be invisible You may not be able to fully trust that friend. I'm just saying, don't leave your wallet lying around within their vicinity. Or it's possible they're just introverted, which is totally fine. Maybe that's why they'd rather be invisible. But an example of a negative question, and one that we talked about a few weeks ago as a staff, was would you rather be, for the rest of your life, unable to hear, deaf, or unable to see, blind? Which of those two negative options would you rather be stuck with? Now, for some individuals, this is not a hypothetical. I know there are some here in our church today who are either hard of hearing or who are hard of seeing. It's a difficult choice were you to be forced to choose between the two because we do take for granted the blessing of being able to hear and the blessing of being able to see. If you had to go without one for the rest of your life, which one would be worse? And as I pondered that question, and all of us around that table were pondering the question, I was thinking, you know, it'd be pretty awful to have to live the rest of my life without being able to hear anything. I really like music. To not be able to ever hear a song again, that would be terrible. To to not be able to hear my children's voices ever again, that, that would be awful. But as difficult as it would be to go through the rest of my life not being able to hear, I think, as far as I'm concerned, it would be a little bit worse even to go through the rest of my life without being able to see. Think about the beautiful landscapes that I'm privileged at times to lay my eyes upon, to go the rest of my life without seeing those things, to observe that beauty would be a very difficult thing. To not be able to see my wife's face, my children's faces, it would be hard to imagine going through this life continually surrounded by darkness. And yet it's not hard for us to imagine walking through this life, continually surrounded by a moral darkness. Because that is the reality of our existence. And sometimes we're shielded from it, but continually, all around us, there is a terrible moral darkness in this world. We are surrounded by, and sometimes even closer than we would imagine, we are surrounded by abuse and trafficking, and violent crime, and abortion, oppression of all kinds, corruption, even in the highest levels of leadership. There is the darkness of idol worship that exists in various cultures in every corner of the globe. 
And apart from that moral darkness, there is just the difficulty of walking through this world tangled with thorns and thistles. We walk through trials and tragedies. We are met at times with sickness and with loss. And all of us, having been born in sin, have experienced the darkness within our own hearts. So much darkness without and within. But the darkness cannot overcome the light. Because God is light. And Jesus is the light of the world. Now, we were introduced to this concept all the way back in chapter 1. We considered this back in December as we went through John's wonderful prologue in chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And in the fourth verse of the book of John, the author states that in him, in the word, in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not over Come it. That's the hope and promise of the word of God for us today. And that verse really gives us an outline for this event that we will consider from John 8. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Point number one today, we see the light shining in the darkness. John 8 verses 12 through the first part of verse 20. Jesus makes a wonderful proclamation in the temple as the Feast of Booths winds down. But before we hear these words of Jesus, it will help us to understand the theme of light that is prominent in the story of God from beginning to end. And all the background that these individuals would have had in mind as Jesus made his great proclamation. You can go back to the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and the third verse, God said, let there be light. And there was light. This theme continues in the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, as God's people, the children of Israel, are in slavery in Egypt. And to free his people, God sends a series of judgments upon the land of Egypt, the penultimate judgment being darkness, pitch darkness, a darkness that could be felt, fell upon the land of Egypt for three years. Days. They couldn't move. They couldn't go anywhere. They could not see at all. And yet for the children of Israel, there was light. And then as God frees his people from Egypt and they begin to make their way through the wilderness, God is with them, guiding and lighting their way through a pillar that was a cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. Exodus 13 says the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night night. We could go on to note many more examples, but I hope you get the idea that light is such a rich theme in God's story. And as part of the Feast of Booths, which has just wound down to an end here in John chapter 8, there was a daily lamp lighting ritual that was a wonderful part of the festival. Now, a few weeks ago, we considered the wonderful water drawing ritual that was another highlight of this feast, but the lamp lighting ritual was another component that the worshipers could look forward to every day of the feast. In a particular temple court called the Court of Women, this is where the treasury boxes were contained. There were four giant golden lamps placed. These were were huge lamps, over 70 foot tall. And every day of the feast, right at dusk, these lamps would be lit. And they would set the entire temple complex in a wonderful 
glow. And the worshipers would rejoice in that light. There was music and singing and dancing as they remembered God's provision of light for their ancestors all the way back in the wilderness. But the celebration of light would not stop in that temple complex. The worshipers would actually take for themselves torches and set them ablaze and go out into the streets of Jerusalem, still singing, still dancing, bringing a glow to the entire city from end to end, celebrating the light of the Lord. This is the context into which Jesus speaks these words. Standing in the treasury, in the midst of those giant candelabra, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light. And this is true, in fact, in a number of senses. Jesus is literally Bright. A few of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, got to experience this one wonderful moment described in Matthew 17 as they went up upon the mountain and Jesus was transfigured before them. As it were, the veil of his humanity fell off for just a moment and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. There is a literal brightness in the Lord. But of course, this also refers to a moral purity. 1 John 1.5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But in this context, I don't think the direct reference is to Jesus' literal brightness or even necessarily to his moral purity, but specifically the fact that he as the light of the world is the one who illuminates who shines a light down the path for us in the midst of this dark world. And this is good news for us. There are a lot of really intelligent people who flounder in the darkness for their whole life, wondering, where did I come from? Why am I here? What is even real? What is the point? But Jesus, the light of the world, brings light to all who see him. And he enlightens not just one corner of this dark world, but every corner of this dark world. He is the light, not just of Jews, but of Gentiles as well. He fulfills Isaiah's prophecy. Chapter 49, verse 6, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. It's a wonderful prophecy there in Isaiah 49 because the Lord says to his servant, to his Messiah, it is too small a thing for you to only be the light of the Jews. We know sometimes that we can be in a context where the light is just inappropriately bright, right? Like in a small room, you don't need like some thousand watt spotlight beaming down. It's too much. And the light of Jesus is too much for just one nation. He is a light to every nation so that the salvation of the Lord may reach to every corner of the globe. This is why we engage in evangelism. This is why we engage in missions, because he is the light of the world and the only light of the world. If the gospel of Jesus does not reach that corner of the world, there will be no light. I'm so thankful for the gifted individuals that God has given to this body to mobilize us for evangelism and for missions efforts. This is a needful thing. He is the only light of the world. But notice Jesus' emphasis here in verse 12 is not only that we would know him as the light and believe in him as the light, but specifically that we would follow him. Whoever follows me, Jesus says, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
This following is a real experience day in and day out as we follow the way of Christ and not the dark ways of this world. This should not be a theoretical, hypothetical thing for us. Following the light should be our daily reality as Christians. This was the reality all the way back in the Exodus as the children of Israel made their way through that wilderness. I mentioned earlier the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire in the wilderness, but I want us to take a moment to see this for ourselves. If you would hold your place in the Gospel of John and turn back to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 9. I'll give you a moment to turn there. It's toward the beginning of your Bibles, the fourth book of the New Testament, Numbers chapter 9. We will see the experience of the people of God as he led them through the wilderness. They didn't have any GPS back then. They couldn't even print off the MapQuest maps. You remember those days when we actually had to print off like nine sheets in order to get anywhere? Even that was better than what the children of Israel had. They had nothing but the Lord to guide their way. Notice verse 9, beginning in verse 15. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Now notice in verse 17, whenever the cloud lifted up from over the tent... After that, the people of Israel set out. They were nomads at this time. And then in the place where the clouds settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out. And at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Verse 19, even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel didn't run ahead of the leading of the Lord. Notice what it says. They kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. That's the experience of following the Lord sometimes, isn't it? We may be eager to go, but the Lord says, wait. And so we wait. And so they waited. But verse 20 says, sometimes the cloud was only a few days over the tabernacle. And according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud only remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. And sometimes the Lord has us moving along fairly quickly, maybe sometimes even more quickly than we would prefer. But it's all in his timing. This is our experience of following the Lord. Verse 22, whether it was two days or a month or a longer time that the cloud continued Continued over the tabernacle, abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped, and at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. I was chuckling to myself as I was examining this scripture this week because it just reiterates again and again and again in almost a pedantic way, really trying to make the point, though, that the children of Israel did and must follow the Lord according to his timing and according to his command. And could you imagine with me the situation of one of those children of Israel, should he decide one day to not follow according to the timing of the Lord. I mean, imagine that this guy settles down for camp and it's one of those quick turnaround times and it's just that like one night thing and the cloud lifts and it starts moving and this guy's like, man, I don't want to walk again today. I was looking forward to like a month long stay. I was really hoping it was one of those, but there that cloud goes again and everyone else, the children of Israel gets up and, and they go and this guy's like, I don't feel like walking. I'm just going to stay here. There goes the pretty cloud. See y'all. Now, what's going to happen to that guy? That night, he's going to be going, why is, why is it so dark? Why am I so cold? Do I hear a growling over there from one of the beasts here in the wilderness? 
You got to follow the leading of the Lord, lest you be exposed, lest you be left in the cold, left in the dark. And yet how often do we do this? Nah, don't feel like following the light today. Well, the only alternative is darkness. And this point is made very clear for us in the New Testament as well. I want to ask you to turn now to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. I'll give you a moment to turn there, but the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 draws upon this same analogy, walking as children of light. This wasn't just something that the ancient Israelites were called to. It is something that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are called to as well. Notice Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. Paul says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk. There's the metaphor. Walk as children of light. Verse 9, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. You experience your heart, even your deepest desires and your actions reflecting more and more goodness and righteousness and truth. That is evidence that you are walking in the light. Verse 10, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of of darkness. It is observable, is it not, that the effects of darkness are to end life and not to propagate life? They are unfruitful works. Verse 12, it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, and here he quotes a song of the early church, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. If you want to be woke, this is the way to be woke. Be woke by the light of Jesus, no longer slumbering in the darkness of sin and the ways of this world. We have the light. Wake up. And when he moves, follow him. This is our joy and privilege as people of the light. Now, as we turn back to John chapter 8, we we'll discover how these words landed upon the immediate audience there. This is really a wonderful revelation that Jesus has given here in John 8, verse 12. And within it is an invitation to all to follow the light. But this particular crowd, these Pharisees, were not postured to hear and accept anything that Jesus was saying, and you know how it is. If you are motivated enough to reject the truth, you will find all kinds of ways to do so. And the Pharisees did so by pointing to a legal technicality. Verse 13, the Pharisees said to him, actually, I inserted that in the text. It doesn't actually say that there, but we can imagine this is the tone of their statement. Actually, Jesus, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. In other words, not legally valid. You're saying, Jesus, we don't have to hear these words because in a court of law, these words would be unsubstantiated. There is not a second witness, and those are the standards of the law. Now, they're not in a court. But apart from that, Jesus says in verse 14, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. It doesn't matter if it's legally valid. It's true either way. Jesus says, I know where I came from and where I am going. You do not know where I came from or where I am going. Apart from the technicalities, Jesus says, the light is shining and it is true. There is a self-attesting quality to light, is there not? Light bears witness of itself. You can stare up at one of these spotlights in the ceiling and ask for a second opinion. Well, light, I see you shining, but I really need a second person to testify before I believe that you're shining. That light doesn't need to provide another witness. It just shines. That's the only witness it needs to bear. 
Can you imagine walking outside and staring up at the sun and saying, well, sun, I see you shining. I see your light, but I'm going to need to verify that by another witness. No, the light doesn't need another witness. It just shines. It is self-attesting, which may be an encouragement to you, by the way, as you speak to your friends and loved ones and neighbors about the Lord, those who don't yet know Jesus, There is some value in knowing how to engage in arguments apologetically. There is value to that. But the most important thing you can do is just let the light shine. To bring down the veil, so to speak, open up the word and let them see Jesus. He will attest to himself quite well. And he will be compelling to those who have eyes to see. But in this case, those he is speaking with are spiritually blind, and so he must continue to engage with them. He brings up another issue that has come up in previous pages, and once again, he mentions here in verse 15 the topic of judgment. He says, you judge according to the flesh. This is the wrong way to judge. Jesus says, I judge no one. Not at this time. This first coming was not yet the time of divine judgment. It was a rescue mission of salvation. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen? But there is a day coming when Jesus will return a second time. And that will be the time for him to judge the world. And he will do so in harmony with his father. Verse 16, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the father who sent me. And now he engages with their legal technicality. He does acknowledge in verse 17, in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. It's legally valid according to Deuteronomy 19.15. So Jesus says, you need two witnesses? All right. Verse 18, I am the one who bears witness about myself. That's one. And the father who sent me bears witness about me. That's two. There are your two witnesses. Verse 9, they object to this. They say to him, therefore, where is your father? You say there's a second witness. We don't see him. Go ahead and produce him for us. Now, there is great irony in this objection because these Pharisees had lived their whole lives marinating in the witness of the Father about the coming Messiah. They knew the Old Testament scriptures. They had memorized large sections of the New Testament scriptures. They scrutinized them down to the word, down to the letter, down to every jot within those letters. They had the witness of the Father already. And yet they had missed the one to whom that witness was pointing. Jesus says, if you can't see me through this witness, then you're not actually hearing the Father. You don't actually know him. Verse 19, Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. But if you miss Jesus, you miss the Father. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. There beneath those giant lamps, even amid the darkness of human resistance, Jesus shines as the light of the world. And the darkness cannot overcome the light. This is point number two today. The darkness cannot overcome the light. The light, as we continue into the second part of verse 20, all the way to verse 30. Now, back in December, as we considered John's prologue, and as we were met with uh, philosophically this idea of light and darkness, you may recall we engaged with this idea for a while. And I want to reiterate some things that I said back then about light and darkness. Because on a basic level, light and dark are opposites, but they are not evenly matched. Conceptually, it's important that we grasp this. 
Light and dark are opposites, but they are not evenly matched. Now, there are some worldviews that will insist that this is so. On a very popular level, who hasn't heard of Star Wars? The light side and the dark side. By the way, the other day that movie happened to be on, it was one of the prequels, and I had forgot about how bad those prequels were. They really are terrible movies. But of course, everyone knows the Star Wars saga, and the originals are pretty good. And, and, and the idea, though... And you can enjoy those movies, but don't be misled by the philosophy. The idea is that light and dark are not only opposites, but they are evenly matched. There's the light side, the dark side, and it's actually a good thing if there is balance. But this is not the Christian worldview. The light is stronger than the darkness. Why? Because darkness actually isn't anything. It's merely the absence of of light. And when light comes up against darkness, darkness will always pierce through. You can imagine this demonstrated by just picturing with me two rooms in a house separated by a closed door. But at the bottom of that door, there is a small gap at the floor. Now, let me ask you, if one of the rooms, the light was off, and one of the rooms, the light was on, would the darkness of the dark room seep under that gap into the light room? No, the light from the light room will pierce into the darkness because the light is stronger because God is light and the darkness cannot overcome it. We see this even in the second half of verse 20. Notice that no one arrested him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. There was no lack of anger against Jesus by these Pharisees. There was no lack of desire to see him destroyed and put to death. But they didn't arrest him. Why? Because he was on a divine timeline and he was invincible until the hour that God chose for him. And by the way, so are you. The light is stronger. And it was preserving Jesus until the hour came for him to give his life. No one could take it from him outside of the will of the Lord. So verse 21, he said to them again, I am going away. This hour would be coming soon. He says, you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot phrase there in the middle of verse 21 is a sobering phrase. You will die in your sin. Death is fearful enough, but to die in your sin, to die with sins unatoned for, to die with sins unforgiven, nothing could be worse than this. And in Jesus' words here, there is a warning for each one of us. Are you prepared for eternity? None of us knows the hour of our death. Will you die in your sins or have those sins been taken care of through Jesus? We prepare for so many other things. You spent a lot of time and a lot of money preparing for your career. You spent a lot of time and a lot of effort preparing for your family. You're probably spending a lot of time and thought right now preparing for your summer vacation. You spend time and thought preparing for your retirement. But are you prepared for eternity? You say, well, Pastor Mike, I've got time. Someday I'll get serious about God. I don't have time for it right now. I don't have the margin in my life. I don't know if I can give it the proper focus. But one of these days, life will slow down, and then I'll get serious about God. But, oh, my friend, you do not know when your last moment will be. And even apart from that, you do not know when your last opportunity will be to respond to God's invitation. These are sobering words in verse 21. For some in that crowd, Jesus is telling them, I'm going away and you will seek me then and it will be too late. You will die in your sin. Only the Lord knows that moment in someone's life of hardening. 
where technically the offer is still there, but it won't get through to that person. They've had their last opportunity. Proverbs chapter 1 speaks to this. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they will not find me. Each opportunity to believe in Jesus could be your last. This is a loving warning of Jesus, but their response is very dismissive, even sarcastic. In verse 22, the Jews said, Will he kill himself since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? Jesus continues to try to get their attention. Verse 23, he said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. What a contrast. But Jesus is not only trying to make the point that they and he were quite different. He is giving them a heads up. You are not okay. Pharisees, though you are seen as the spiritual leaders, though you are religiously privileged, you have standing and status and you think you're okay. You are not. You need help. You need divine help from above. And at this point, you're earthly. You're being led by the prince of the power of this world. Verse 24, I told you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am you will die in your sins. At this point, that was their destination. Unless they were to turn and believe in Jesus, believe in him as the I am. Once again, we see both warning and invitation in the words of Christ. But as I hope you know, the gospel must contain both warning and invitation. It must affirm the bad news before presenting the good news of salvation. I know this is hard for us, especially for the people pleasers among us. We hate breaking bad news to people, especially when it involves eternal punishment. And so we want to say to our friends, well, you know, I'm following Jesus and, you know, you should probably consider it as well. Your life will probably be a little bit better if you follow Jesus. You know, take it or leave it though. I don't want to offend you. Do your thing, but, you know, maybe maybe choose Jesus. That's not Jesus' approach. You will die in your sins unless you believe. I know people want to avoid things that smell like hellfire and brimstone. Jesus talked about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. He loved people too much to not warn them. And if your posture is to comfort people in their unbelief, lest they see you as not a nice person, that may make your day a little bit easier, but it could make their eternity horrible. See, it is the father of lies who seeks to comfort people in their unbelief and sin. Remember what the serpent said to Eve all the way back in Genesis 3. Go ahead and eat that apple. You will not surely die. Satan knows how to avoid fire and brimstone preaching. But that lie plunged the world into sin. Jesus loves enough to warn and to present himself as the light, as the Savior. Believe that I am he. Now, in the original, it just says, believe that I am. And we're coming to understand, aren't we, the import of that phrase, ego a me, I am. That's a divine claim. It's not enough to believe in a version of Jesus that is less than fully God. I hate to say it, but there are a lot of people who maybe very sincerely believe in a version of Jesus that is less than fully God, and that version of Jesus does not save. Jesus says, believe that I am. That's the invitation. Verse 25, so they said to him, who are you? Now, this is not an innocent question. It is meant to be dismissive. We could read it in this way. You? Who are you to be making such claims? They were judging according to the flesh. 
Jesus said to them, I'm just what I've been telling you from the beginning. His witness had been consistent to who he was. Back in chapter four, he told the woman at the well, I am the Messiah. In chapter five, he said, I am the divine son of God. I'm the only way to pass from death to life. In chapter six, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And now he has said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He says, that's who I am. Do you know who you are? They were resisting the fact that they were from below. Verse 26, he says, I have much to say about you, much to judge, but he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Notice here in verse 28, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. I love this statement, by the way, in verse 29 of the perfection of Jesus. We know he was sinless. We know he always avoided doing the thing that was wrong. But positively, he never failed to do the thing that was right, always doing the things that were pleasing to the Lord. And yet, despite this perfection, he would be lifted Notice again that short phrase in verse 28, lifted up on a cross. We know this is the meaning of the phrase because there are two other times in this gospel that this term is used. We considered one back in chapter 3. Jesus is discussing with Nicodemus, and he tells him, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal Life. Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up as a source of salvation to those who are sick and wounded in their sins. Look and live. And then in chapter 12, Jesus and John are even more clear about what this phrase means. Chapter 12, 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. He was going to be lifted up on a terrible, rugged Roman cross. And there is a wonderful irony in this as well. Because the intent of the Roman cross was to lift up a criminal as a warning to all who would cross the authority of the Roman Empire. They would lift someone up in humiliation so that all could see how terrible they are. And yet when Jesus was lifted up on the Roman cross, it was his glory that was exalted, even through that humiliation. See, the Romans would lift one up on a cross so that they might say, look at this one who has stolen the goods of others. But Jesus was lifted up so that we might point to him and say, look at the one who has poured himself out for the good of others. The Romans would lift up one on the cross so that they could say of him, look at this one who has taken life. But Jesus was lifted up on the cross so that we might point to him and say, look at this one who is giving life. The Romans would lift up one on a cross to be able to point and say, look at what this terrible criminal has done. But Jesus was lifted up so that we might point to him and say, look at what this wonderful Savior has done. 
Jesus would allow himself to be lifted up in that way to make it plain who he was and what he was about. That's why he says in verse 28, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am. Am. Go ahead and hang me high up on that cross. You'll only be contributing to my glory. You will only be putting on display the perfection of my justice and love and mercy. This was a great act of darkness, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. No darker act has ever been performed in this world. The sinless Son of God, cruelly put to death. That's why three hours of darkness fell at midday. But the darkness cannot overcome the light. And after three days in the tomb, early on Sunday morning, as the sun rose, the sun rose And his resurrection glory continues to shine and will shine for all eternity. Revelation 21, 23 says of the new Jerusalem that that city needs no sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamp. So here in John 30, we are told that as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Do you? Do you believe in him as the light of the world, as the only Savior? I appreciate so much the many here in our church, the many wonderful volunteers who gave of your time and effort and love and labor to make Vacation Bible School happen a couple of weeks ago. It was a wonderful event. Thank you to all of you who put forth effort to make that happen for our children. It was a great occasion, a fun occasion, and lots of good things were learned by all who attended. And as a pastor, I was so grateful for all the children who had the opportunity to learn those wonderful things in a fun environment. And also as a father, I was very grateful that my own children were able to be a part of that and to benefit from it. It led to some wonderful conversations because the theme of the week was about the kingdom of God. And the fact that God is stronger than the enemy. Take up the armor of God so that you may be strengthened to engage in this battle. A wonderful biblical theme. I was engaging with one of my children toward the end of the week. And he said, I'm learning this week that Jesus is strong. I said, yes, that's good. Jesus is indeed strong. Is Jesus the strongest? Yes, Jesus is the strongest. Jesus is stronger than all the enemies. Yes, Jesus is stronger than all the enemies. Jesus is, is he stronger than Satan? Yes, Jesus is stronger than Satan. Well, dad, then how were they able to get him up on that cross? And I thought, well, that is a great question. And that brings us right to the heart of the gospel. Jesus answered that question. He said, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. For us to be saved, there had to be a sinless, substitutionary sacrifice. Why did Jesus, the all-powerful one, allow himself to be arrested? Why did Jesus allow himself to be humiliated in those kangaroo courts of law? Why did Jesus allow himself to be lacerated by whips on the back time and time again? Why did he allow them to beat a crown of thorns into his brow? Why did he, the all-powerful one, allow his arms to be stretched and his feet to be stretched and nailed to those rough beams of wood and lifted up in humiliation for all the world to see and scorn? Why? It was for you. 
was for me. It was in our place so that when we die, we do not need to die in our sins. Father, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending him. We're so grateful today that the light of the world stepped down into darkness. We would be lost and blind and without hope, without his light. We're so thankful for sending Jesus to illuminate our way so that we don't have to stumble around in the darkness anymore. We can follow him as children of light. My friend, if you are here today and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, the invitation is extended to you. Unless you believe that Jesus is all he claimed to be, you will die in your sins. But if you do believe, you will have life forever. And you can receive him right now. Right there in your seat, you can call out to the Lord, acknowledging your guilt before him, acknowledging that you have sinned and fallen short in so many ways, thanking him for sending Jesus to live the perfect life that we have all failed to live, to die on the cross for our sins, and then rising again to give eternal life to all who will believe. Don't delay until the next opportunity. You don't know that the next opportunity will be there. Receive him today.